I'm going to present the, uh, the radio piece that was aired on Marketplace, which was the, the first story that aired about this. Um, this was a, uh, a condensed version of the, uh, the This American Life report um, that aired later that day. But this will give you, if you haven't heard the reports on this, this will give you an idea of uh, what we did. This is Kai Rizdal with the Marketplace Radio Shorts. This is a big day for Apple. The iPad 3 goes on sale today. Another retail and media coup for a company that's taken its share of media heat the past couple of months. A big series in the New York Times about conditions at the Chinese factories where Apple makes its iPhones and its iPads. A full hour on This American Life from a guy named Mike Daisy. An amazing, detailed story about his trip to some of those factories. A story he originally told in a state piece, a monologue called The Agony and the Ecstasy of Steve Jobs. And she listens to this and she says, but you are not a businessman. <laughs> and I say, that's true. I am not a businessman. And she says, and you aren't going to buy their products. And I say, that's true. I'm, I'm not going to buy their products. And she says, you will lie to them. <laughs> and I say, yes, Kathy. I'm going to lie to lots of people. Our China correspondent Rob Schmitz has been reporting on Apple's supply chain for years, the factories in China, and some of the abuses there. And when he heard Daisy's story, it just didn't sound right. So he tracked down Daisy's Chinese interpreter. He met her in front of the same factory she'd taken Daisy to, and he started asking questions. In a collaboration with This American Life, here's Rob. For years, reporters in China have uncovered a long list of problems showing the dark side of what it's like to work at factories that assemble Apple products. Mike Daisy claimed he encountered firsthand some of the most egregious examples of this history, all in just a six-day trip he took to the city of Shenzhen. Here's one example from his monologue. It takes place at a meeting he had had with an illegal workers union. He meets a group of workers who've been poisoned by the chemical N-hexane while working on the iPhone assembly line. And all these people have been exposed. Their hands shake uncontrollably. Most of them can't even pick up a glass. Kathy Lee, Daisy's translator in Shenzhen, was with him at this meeting. I meet her at one of the places she took Daisy, the gates of Foxconn. Did you meet people who fit this description? No. So you, there was nobody who said that they were poisoned by hexane? No, nobody mentioned the hexane. I asked Kathy to confirm other details in Daisy's play, like the claim that the gates were patrolled by armed guards. Did the guards have guns when you came here with Mike Daisy? No. Definitely to no. And with nearly every detail, the answer is the same. No. <laughs> this is not true. Daisy claims he met underage workers at Foxconn. He says he talked to a man whose hand was twisted into a claw for making iPads. He describes visiting factory dorm rooms with beds stacked to the ceiling. But Kathy says none of this happened. Last week, together with Ira Glass, the host of This American Life, I confronted Daisy in an interview. I brought up the workers he says he met who were poisoned by N-hexane. I tell him what Kathy said. Kathy says that you did not talk to workers who were poisoned by hexane. That's correct. So you lied about that. That wasn't what you saw. I wouldn't express it that way. How would you express it? I would say that I wanted to tell a story that captured the totality of my trip. Did you meet workers like that or did you just read about the issue? I met workers in um, Hong Kong going to uh, Apple protests who um, uh, had not been poisoned by hexane but had known people who had been and it was like a constant conversation that we were having about those workers. So you didn't actually meet an actual worker who had been poisoned by hexane? That's correct. Hexane. Daisy apologized to Ira Glass for not telling the truth to him and his listeners. Look, I'm not going to say that I didn't take a few shortcuts in my passion to be heard. But I stand behind the work. My mistake, the mistake I truly regret, is that I had it on your show as journalism. And it's not journalism. It's theater.
This American Life wasn't the only journalistic outlet for Daisy. For the past year, he's been in the news constantly. Newspaper articles, op-eds, magazine profiles, online news sites. He's made numerous television appearances, CNN, C-SPAN, Bill Maher. And he usually says things like this from an appearance on MSNBC a month ago. I saw all the things that, that, that uh, everyone's been reporting on. I saw underage workers. I talked to workers who were uh, 13, 14, 15 years old. I, I met people whose hands have been destroyed from doing the same motion again and again on the line. Uh, Making Apple products. Yes. What makes this complicated is that the things Daisy lied about seeing are things that have actually happened in China. Workers making Apple products have been poisoned by hexane. Apple's own audits show the company has caught underage workers at a handful of its suppliers. These things are rare, but together they form an easy-to-understand narrative about Apple. People like a very simple narrative. Adam Minter is a columnist for the financial news service Bloomberg. He spent years visiting more than 150 Chinese factories. He's writing a book about the global recycling industry. He says the reality of factory conditions in China is complicated. Working at Foxconn can be grueling, but most workers will tell you they're happy to have the job. He says Daisy's become a media darling because he's used an emotional performance to focus on a much simpler message. Foxconn bad iPhone, bad, you know, sign a petition, now you're good. That's a great simple message, and it's going to resonate with a public radio listener. Um, it's going to resonate with a New York Times reader, and, and I think uh, that's one of the reasons why he's, he's had so much traction. And Minter says the fact that Daisy has not told the truth to people about what he saw in China won't have much of an impact on how the public sees this issue. And Apple will continue to try to clean up its image. The company's hired an independent auditor to inspect its suppliers throughout China. Charles Duhigg is a New York Times reporter who helped write an investigative series on Apple's supply chain. He told us that it may be hard to track whether conditions are improving because Apple hasn't yet released data that can be compared on a year-by-year basis. My understanding is that Apple has said that they are going to begin releasing essentially granular data. And so we're looking for that to test the claims that things are improving as a result of Apple going in and demanding changes. And if Apple does become more transparent about its supply chain, that could mean a step towards better working conditions, something Mike Daisy has been fighting for all along. From Shenzhen, I'm Rob Schmidt for Marketplace. I heard it about... I think it was around a week after it aired, and I podcast uh, This American Life uh, on my computer, on this computer back home, home in Shanghai. And um, when I heard it, I was, I remember I was actually in the bathroom when I heard it, I was like, I think I was taking a shower or something. And, and I, I sort of stuck my head out after I heard a couple of things. He started talking about um, the guards with guns, and I thought, well, that's, that's weird. You know, I've been to a lot of factories, and no, I've never seen that before. And he also starts talking about the workers who were shaking and who were poisoned by N-hexane. And, you, you know, that was a thousand miles away from me. Yeah, and, you know, I, I, I've, I've talked to those workers. So then I thought, oh, this is interesting. I thought, how did those workers ever get down there? How did he talk to these workers? Um, there were many other things in the monologue that I thought, oh, that doesn't make any sense. And then, you know, I thought, okay, well, maybe this is just fiction. Uh, and then I heard Ira Glass say, um, you know, we thoroughly fact-checked him. I thought, oh, wow. Um, so, and then I listened to it again, and then I, um, I remember calling some of my, my reporter friends, you know, and, and emailing them and saying, have you guys seen this or heard this, you know? Um, and then they listened to it, and then all of us were just thinking, you know, this is, what is going on here? Who is this guy? Yeah. Because, you know, when you live in China, you're, you're so divorced from um, American pop culture, and you don't know, you're, you really are in a bubble, and you really don't know what's going on back home. And so we were all thinking, what is going on back home? Uh, so I, it, it was kind of the way that it happened was that after I started this conversation with other reporters and academics about this, um, my, my wife and we had a baby. My wife and I had a baby. And um, I ended up, I was on paternity leave. And, and then I realized, uh, you know, I think one day on paternity leave, I thought, well, I'll, I'll check this out. Uh, and so I thought, well, 
Her name's Kathy. That would be yeah. the only person that I could find that could verify any of this. Translator. And you knew that This American Life had not talked to her? I mean, at least oh, I didn't know any of that. You no, I had no idea. And so I, I, I just wrote into Google, I put Kathy and translator and Shenzhen, because I knew this was in Shenzhen. And I saw a bunch of entries, and the, the first entry had a phone number. <laughs> <laughs> It was an amazing investigative project. <laughs> I mean, it was the opposite of a traditional investigative project where you pour through data and you, you're working in a group and you know, you're finding the discrepancies you know, and it takes you months and then you finally nail them. You know? uh, it was like the opposite of that. It was just all of a sudden, I, you know, the payback was, wow, it's there. I found her. Was her name Kathy Lee, just as the... Look, yeah, her name was Kathy Lee, and I called her. I, I, um, I recorded the conversation, and that conversation is on This American Life. They, they, part of, they used part of it. And um, I, you know, I asked her, you know, are you, have you worked with a gentleman named Mike Daisy? And mm -hmm. yes, I have. And, and then I asked a couple questions about the details that he put in the monologue. And, and um, I asked, the first question I asked was about the children. I said, well, did you meet 12 and 13 year olds outside of Foxconn? She said, no. So I said, she would didn't you? know about the This American Life Story? She had no idea that, 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 not only she had no idea about This American Life Story, she had no idea that Mike Daisy had turned this into anything. Right. Because the last thing that he told her when he left was that she was under the impression that he was writing an article. And she didn't. She never talked to him after that, and so she didn't know any of this. And so I had to explain all of this to her. We were all surprises to her. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so within about three hours, I was on a plane uh, to Shenzhen. Wow. Yeah. And then when you called, did you call Ira Glass? No. <laughs> he called me. Because uh, <laughs> you had a marketplace. Did you uh, tell, tell about how all that happened? Well, um, after I went down to Shenzhen and, and spoke to Kathy and got all of the facts straight, and I got emails between her and, and Mike Daisy and all the evidence I could find of, of that he was actually there, I uh, wrote it all in this extremely long email. It's like one of these emails as, as an editor, you, you just, you're like, oh God, what is wrong with this guy? Uh, and so I think that my editors thought I was insane because it was a 10 to 15 page memo that read like a, like a legal brief, you know, because I had done research on Daisy himself and, you know, it was, uh, it was very involved, you know, I was, I was excited. Uh, and uh, I handed... Part of depression. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I, uh, I handed it to my, for the, my, my editor, uh, John Buckley, who's a foreign editor at Micro Marketplace, and then he discussed it with, the, 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 with management at Marketplace. And uh, Deborah Clark, who is right here, sitting in the front row, is, who's our executive producer at Marketplace, uh, actually spoke with This American Life about it. And then uh, the next week, I think, on a Tuesday, I believe, uh, it was evening time, I was, uh, I was sleeping, and I got a call, and it was Ira Glass. And it was interesting because, you know, I've, as a public radio reporter, I'm a big fan of This American Life. And, you know, his voice is so, you know, distinctive. And so when I heard the voice, I, oh my gosh. You know, and, and, uh, and you know, he was, he had the right time. He was, he was, he felt terrible about it. And, but we, we worked, uh, from then on, we worked uh, on it for about two straight weeks. I think it, for them, it was, it was very tough, you know, but they devoted uh, an entire hour long, their weekly episode to the, the retraction itself. And you were part of that just by audio from... Yeah, like yeah, so what happened was um, uh, we uh, confronted Mike Daisy, uh, you know, he came into the studio of This American Life in New York and I was in Shanghai and uh, that interview took uh, two hours, and it was a very grueling interview uh, for everybody. Uh, I don't know if, if anyone's heard the This American Life um, episode. Um, there were very long pauses in that, and I was, jo I was joining this by ISDN, which is a digital line, and there was one, there was one pause that lasted 37 seconds. 
And actually, they edited it for the final version on This American Life because, you know, that would just be like a minute of dead air. Um, but when that happened, I thought that the ISDN line had dropped. And I thought, oh, no, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm interviewing him. And I started pushing buttons. But in, in fact, he was, I, I couldn't see what was going on. And, and I think that he was just collecting his thoughts. You know, This American Life certainly did not start out as a pure journalism program. You know, it started out in the mid-90s as a, a program that was more of a variety kind of program. And, and I think that over the years, at least from what I've seen and what I've heard, and this, this might not be how they characterize it, but, but what I've heard is that uh, they've gotten, and if for listeners, I think you might agree with this, is that they've kind of moved towards a journalism format in some ways. But I could be wrong. I mean, I, I think that's up for debate and you know maybe that's a question that they're they're asking themselves right now yeah. I'm in public radio and because I know public radio you know it's possible that because a lot of the journalists in China you know there's only four of us that are in public radio right from the United States um, most of the press corps there are print yeah. um, it's possible that they thought when they heard it oh, okay this is that's fake maybe it's yeah I don't know maybe this is a like a radio novella or something. I don't really know. But I, I you know, so I, I shouldn't even conjecture on this because I have no idea. But I think a lot of people afterwards, you know, you know thought, they, they came up to me, I, I've been approached by a lot of journalists saying, you know, I thought it was fake too and I'm glad you did something. But uh, yeah, I don't know why. I mean, you know. It's, well, it's, we're proud of you. Thanks. So, thanks. So, Joe, you could um, let us hear a little more. Sure. So well, uh, yeah. I, I, I could, uh, you know what I might do is I might just show, um, what I might do is I might just show this, which is sort of the, some of the photos. Um, I find that when, I, when I'm doing photos, a lot of times I can kind of describe things a little better. Um, so just to give some background, after the Mike Daisy story aired, we decided that um, it would be a really good idea to do an actual series of stories on the actual workers. Because I've, I felt, and, and I think we felt at Marketplace, that you know, the, in, throughout this whole debate, it was this, and, and the, the media coverage of this whole thing sort of focused on Mike Daisy. And I felt like that the focus needed to be on the workers themselves, because that's who we were talking about in the first place. And that seemed to be lost in a lot of the media coverage. And so we thought that it would be a good idea to actually devote um, a series of stories um, to these workers. Now, after we had hatched this plan, um, I got a call from uh, Foxconn. And uh, it was the special assistant to the CEO of Foxconn. Um, Terry Goh is the CEO, and uh, the special assistant's name is Louis Wu. And Louis called me, and he invited me to take a tour of their Shenzhen uh, facility in Longhua, which is their biggest factory in China. 240,000 people work at this factory. Um, it is very, very difficult to get access to a facility like this, um, especially this particular factory, because it has a history. This was a factory where a lot of the suicides happened uh, in 2010. So it's not a factory that they you know, say, hey, come on in. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a really kind of locked down place. It's got gates. It does not have guards with guns, but it does have guards. Um, so I said, sure, that sounds great. And two days later, Apple called me, which was even, for me, I mean, I understand why they were doing this, but I had been trying to get a hold of Apple for about two years, and I've done uh, stories on their supply chain, especially on the environmental impact of their suppliers in China. And I had um, you know, found one supplier who was violating Chinese environmental law. And you know, throughout th this process, trying to get them on the phone to talk on the record was, was extremely challenging. Apple is a very secretive uh, company. It does not usually talk on the record ever. Um, and, and sometimes they do, but it's always when it's not something that's controversial. And so to get a call from them was Oh wow! And it was it was you know the, someone high up, and and they then offered to see a, an iPad assembly line uh, at 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 the Foxconn facility down in Loha, and uh, I said, yeah, that sounds that sounds great. And so, could I ask you 
ask you if Bob Kerr and Saturday had attempted to reach Ira Glass and This American Life after the show? This American Life attempted to reach them. After Fox the show? No, this was before the show. This was before their original show. Um, Foxconn, I asked, I asked, that was one of my first questions to Lewis. I said, why didn't you do that? And he said that, I can tell you that they were, I think, nervous about uh, being in the same program head to head with someone like Mike Daisy. Um, because I don't, th I think that their, their tack on this was that you know, this guy, they, they knew he was lying. And we don't want to be up against someone like that, you know, as the evil corporation, because it's not how is that good for us? What's that going to do for us? Um, and so they offered, um, they sent a very long email to This American Life giving, their, giving them their uh, side of the story. Um, Apple was contacted, but Apple, in pure Apple fashion, did not respond to This American Life. Um, so anyway, I, I went to, uh, when Apple got involved, they, they, uh, they changed the date of my uh, factory visit a week later. And this was a big debate because they did that so that it could coincide with the Fair Labor Association audit. And I knew what they were doing because I knew that this audit was coming, this report was coming out soon. And so I was thinking, okay, that's a little sneaky. And I'd already made my plans to go to Shenzhen to visit the factory because I had already made these plans with Foxconn. And so I kept those plans. And what I did instead is I spent a week talking to workers outside the gates. And Foxconn and nor Apple knew I was there. And it was really good, a good time to be there because I didn't want people over my shoulders. I didn't want the workers to be scared you know, to talk to me about certain things. And I ended up following uh, the money that one worker was making back home to his home village. And this ended up in a piece that aired last week on Marketplace. And so we had two pieces on last week, one devoted to the workers and one devoted to the bosses. Um, so one is what Apple and Foxconn want you to see when you go inside uh, the Foxconn facility. And one is what the workers, uh, their, from their perspective, what it's like working there. This was one of the workers I highlighted in that, um, in that series. His name is uh, Logo Fen, and he is, uh, he's worked at Foxconn for two years. He makes $378 uh, a month. That's about uh, $14 or $15 a day. And he um, puts the Wi-Fi components into an iPad. It takes him less than 10 seconds to do this, and he does it hundreds of times uh, a day for about 10 hours a day. Um, he makes uh, enough money, he says, to send around, um, oh gosh, I'm gonna have to do the conversion in my head. It's 10,000 renminbi, so that's, Clay, help me here. Thank you. Yeah, okay, for $1,400 back home uh, last year. And um, he told me that that money was being used to uh, go towards an addition to their house, their family home in his home village in, in Jiangxi province. And he was very proud of that. He also, the money also went uh, to help his brother, who is right here. And his brother is, uh, is, is now an engineer, thanks to his brother that works at Foxconn, because he just paid for his uh, engineering degree at a vocational school. Now, when I went to his village to follow the money, I met his mother. And uh, his mother there is standing in front of a pile of bricks. And this pile of bricks was just paid for by what I thought was her son's money. But in the story, if you hear the story, um, as I'm talking, right, <laughs> right after this photo, I think, I was just talking to her. I said, so you must be really proud of your son. He paid for this addition to your home. And, um, she, she looked at me a little confused and sort of smiled and then motioned to me to come inside her home. And then she said, you know what? We're paying for most of this, my husband and I, because my son doesn't make enough money and he's not saving enough money down at that stupid factory job to even help us with anything. And then she went on this, it was a very much a very tiger mom type of uh, uh, diatribe against her poor son 
And I was just kind of horrified that she was saying these things. But she said, oh, he's been lazy ever since he was born. He's always done a half-assed job at everything he's ever done. And that's why he ended up at a factory doing this mindless work. What a waste of time this is. He's losing his mind doing this stuff. He's not using any part of anything that will ever end up. You know, it was, it was incredible. She just went off. In, in local Jiangxi dialect. And so I had a, a man, someone uh, translating for me from Jiangxi dialect to Mandarin for me. So I was, I was listening and you know, just <laughs> talking. <laughs> I was, I, you know, so this is one of these moments when you're, as a journalist, this is such a China moment. If anyone's reported in China, you, know, you, you, you automatically think, OK, this is what the story is going to be like. And I remember calling my editor from the bus saying, oh, and I'm going to follow the money home. And he built this home. And it's, you know, it's going to be a great little story. And then I get there, and she just blows it up. <laughs> you know, just bricks, right? And, and, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, wow. And then I called my editor after this. And I said, you're not going to believe this, but yeah. You know, He's, you know, she, he's under the illusion that he's helping his family, and she's not, she's not having any of it. And my editor, John Buckley, said, this is perfect. <laughs> said, this is so counterintuitive. I love it. And so, you know, and I loved it, too. I thought it was a really interesting story. And, and, and it shows some of the complexities, I think, uh, of China. Because just when you think you understand it, you don't. And, and I think that that's pretty much China in a nutshell, for, 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 at least for me. Uh, is the more I know, the less I understand. Was he John's brother, the engineer? <laughs> His brother was, came with me on this trip. And so he was there when I was speaking to her. And he was quiet for a while, and the mom went outside to do something. I looked at the brother, I said, why aren't you defending your brother? What's going on? He said, it's my mom. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> so I understood that. Um, this is Louis Wu. He's a special assistant to CEO Terry Go. This is Louis, Louis Wu's office at Foxconn. This company made $121 billion in revenue last year. Yeah. So this tells you how frugal this company is, right? Yeah, it's amazing. Terry's, no, Terry's office at Longhua is actually very similar to this. It's a little nicer. It's got a better view than a, a, a cheap uh, feather, blue feather thing that he's got on there. This is a typical dorm room at Foxconn. This is an eight room, uh, uh, eight bunk, eight bed room uh, in the female dormitory. And uh, workers will pay, it's a subsidized housing situation. Workers will pay around $20 a month. Um, to live in a place like this. They have a kitchen, they have a television room. Um, very rudimentary, but also very typical, I think, in China. Um, so it might look pretty bad for American eyes, but in China, this actually is pretty run of the mill. This is downtown Longhua campus at Foxconn. This is inside the factory. This is inside the factory campus. Okay, so like I said, there are 200, there are about a quarter million people that work here. And so it's it's a city. It's like a big city. And it's got a main drag. It's got a shopping center. It's got a wedding photo place. It's got, uh, you know, there's a barber shop here. It's got uh, subsidized fast food. It's got uh, a soccer stadium. So this is, this is the factory complex as seen from above. Olympic sized swimming pool, <laughs> which I'm sure they cleaned before I came. <laughs> This is the front gate of Foxconn at 7 in the morning when the workers are coming in. This is on a slow day. This is on a Monday because on a Tuesday, you would have 100,000 workers coming out and 100,000 workers going in. On this day, only 100,000 workers were going in. So it was a slow day. And you, you can, the video's on uh, our website as well as it's gone viral on YouTube, I, I, I hear. This is the roll call of the iPad assembly line. And of course, this is an iPad as seen from the inside out, which is a, a view we don't often see. Um, what, I, what struck me about this factory the most was just, um, I've been to several factories before in China, and you usually see a fair degree of automation on a, on a typical assembly line, especially in an electronics factory. Um, I didn't see much of that here. 
Uh, what I saw were workers everywhere doing every single part of the evolution of an iPad. So if you have an iPad, you can be assured that almost every single screw and the thing that, everything that holds that thing together was done by human hands. Uh, most of it was not done by machine. Um, and that, I think, blew me away the most when I saw that, when I realized how many people were on this line. It, it really is incredible. And they're all doing just the same motion, you know, maybe 10, sometimes five seconds uh, all day. And what's really interesting is, you know, you, and you hear this in the, uh, in the piece, uh, in both pieces that we did last week, um, is that they're doing this to this chorus of these robotic voices, these robotic female voices that are constantly saying, okay, 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 because every part is scanned after they put it in, and so they scan it, and they make sure that it's a quality control measure, they make sure that everything's okay, and so you hear this over and over, and you hear it everywhere. It's so much that it's, you go in there, and it's, it's, it's just hypnotic. And, and so you, you'll, you can hear this in, um, in, our, in my piece. I sort of focused on it a bit. But it was something also that really struck me. It was not only the, 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 the sheer amount of workers, but this kind of cadence, this OK, 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 OK. So yeah, it was very interesting. Um, this was interesting. Every day at this facility, they have hundreds of people who show up from the countryside to apply for work. On this day, which was a typical day, I was told, there were 500 people in line. This is right in front of the HR building at Foxconn. All of these workers, or most of these workers, just came off a bus or a train, where they, some of them were days on a train or a bus. And they're very tired. They're wearing all the clothes they've got on their back. And um, they're hoping that they can get a job. 60% of them will get a job on this day. Um, so, uh, the ones that don't are going to have to look at another factory. This is uh, towards the end of the assembly line. <laughs> this is the break room. And I thought that this was, I think this is my last photo, but I think this was actually my favorite part of, of that factory because it shows you that these are individuals. Every single cup is different. And these are individuals, these are humans. And um, this was really the only place in that factory where you were reminded of that. 